there's a few in the heart and the spirit of a disciple so that you may use me as an instrument in your hands as you reconcile the community back to thyself. Lord, use me. And we'll keep up the Antioch core values here at Antioch. We are seeking to empower individuals to be all they should be, could be, or ought to be. We seek to restore hope for the broken and the hurting, develop disciples through love, serve the community in love. We pray that God helps us be the church that triumphs. Mm -hmm. Together we'll read Psalms 115 and 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us. But unto thy name, give glory. For thy mercy. Amen. 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 So we've been in the book of Ruth this entire month, and it has been a great study for me personally. Uh, hope it has been just as much of a blessing to you all and beneficial to you all in your lives. And even um, I hope that we have garnered some fresh revelation from a familiar book. Um, mm -hmm. But y'all let me know what happened last week in chapter three. Everybody go at once. Naomi was preparing Ruth to go and meet Boaz. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what, what we learn about what we learned from chapter three. What I learned from chapter three mm -hmm. that a mother in law is teaching and grooming mm -hmm. a young person about relationships with men. That's good. Anyone else? Yeah, I saw that Boaz. Okay. I saw that Boaz was an honorable man and he was so honorable that he also made sure that uh, Ruth's uh, was protected at, at her and she was honored as well. That's good. But we also yeah. learned, as Miss Clifford said, that uh, Naomi groomed Ruth for Boaz because uh, after they, after she had gleaned and got the weed and everything, he, uh, he seen something he wanted. And she looked at him, and he was not bad for the eyes. So uh, <laughs> Naomi told him exactly what to do. When you lay down there with him, I said, my mama would have killed me. She <laughs> <laughs> said, when you lay down there with him, pull the cover a little bit. You know, let him know. And I thought, man, that that's something. That is something. But anyhow. Uh, I, I, Marla did such a good job. She really, really did. Chapter three. So. That's good. All right. So y'all remember the review? I'm not sure if everybody was with us last time, but we'll go over the overview of Ruth um, through uh, this uh, video that I found uh, on YouTube. You can find it too. It's just type in YouTube uh, summary of Ruth. And the Bible Project, the Bible Project actually has all the books of the Bible summarized. And uh, I utilize Bible Project because the curators of the Bible Project are both Hebrew biblical scholars um, or well, a Hebrew biblical scholar and a New Testament scholar. So, um, you know, they're a trusted, a trusted source. Um, but anyways. Uh, real quick, for those that might not have been with us and need a, 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 a follow-up to where we are today, um, but here is a summary of the entire chapter of the Book of Ruth. And, and for those that already know, let, let's see if we find, see something or hear something that we didn't know uh, that sticks with us, that didn't stick with us the, over this course of time. The Book of Ruth. It's a brilliant work of theological art, and it invites us to reflect on the question of how God is involved in the day-to-day -day joys and hardships of our lives. 
There are three main characters in the book, Naomi the widow, Ruth the Moabite, and Boaz the Israelite farmer. And their story is told in four chapters that are beautifully designed. Let's just dive in and see how this all unfolds. Chapter 1 opens with this line, in the days when the judges ruled. And it reminds us of the very dark and difficult days from the book of Judges. And here we meet an Israelite family in Bethlehem, struggling to survive through a famine. And so in search of food, they move on to the land of Moab, Israel's ancient enemy. And there the father of the family dies, and the sons marry two Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. And then the sons, they die too. And so they leave only Naomi and these new daughters-in-law. And so Naomi, she has no reason to stay anymore. And so she tells her new daughters-in-law that she's moving back home. And Naomi, she knows that the life of an unmarried foreign widow in Israel is going to be very hard. And so she compels the women to stay behind. Orpah agrees. But Ruth does not. She shows remarkable loyalty to Naomi. And she says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will become my people, and your God will become my God. And so the two of them return to Israel together. And the chapter concludes with Naomi changing her name to Mara, which means bitter in Hebrew. And she laments her tragic fate. Chapter 2 begins with Naomi and Ruth discussing where they're going to find food. And it just so happens to be the beginning of the barley harvest. And so Ruth goes out to look for food, and it just so happens that she ends up picking grain in the field of a man named Boaz, who just so happens to be Naomi's relative. We're told that Boaz is a man of noble character, and he notices Ruth. And so after finding out more about her story, he shows remarkable generosity to her. He makes these special provisions so that the immigrant Ruth can gather grain in his field. And in doing so, Boaz is actually obeying an explicit command of the Torah to show generosity to the immigrant and the poor. Boaz is so impressed by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi, he prays for her that God will reward her for her boldness. So Ruth comes home that day, and Naomi finds out that she met Boaz, and she is thrilled. She says Boaz is their family redeemer. Now, this family redeemer thing, this was a cultural practice in Israel where if a man in the family died and he left behind a wife or children or land, it was the family redeemer's responsibility to marry that widow, to take up the land and protect that family. So Naomi, she begins to hope that perhaps there might still be a future for her family. Chapter 3 begins with Naomi and Ruth making a plan to get Boaz to notice their situation. So Ruth is going to stop wearing clothes of a grieving widow, and she's going to show signs that she's available to be married. And so Ruth goes to meet Boaz on the farm that night. And as she approaches, Boaz wakes up, and he's totally startled. And Ruth makes her intentions very clear. She asks if Boaz will redeem Naomi's family and marry her. Boaz is once again amazed by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi and her family, and he calls Ruth a woman of noble character. It's the same term used to describe the woman of Proverbs 31. So Boaz tells Ruth to wait until the next day, and he will redeem both Ruth and Naomi legally before the town elders. And so the chapter ends with Ruth returning to Naomi, and they marvel together at all of these recent events. In chapter 4, it all comes together. It turns out, at the last minute, Boaz discovers there is a family member who's closer to Naomi than he is, and he's actually eligible before him to redeem the family. But at the last second, this family member finds out that he's going to have to marry Ruth, the Moabite, and so he declines. But Boaz, remember, he knows Ruth's true character, and so he acquires the family property of Naomi, and he marries Ruth. And so just at the beginning, how Ruth was loyal to Naomi's family, so now Boaz is loyal to Naomi's family as well. The story concludes with a reversal of all of the tragedies from chapter 1. So the death of the husband and the sons is reversed as Ruth is married again and gives birth to a new son, granting joy to Naomi. And this symmetry between the opening and the closing, it's even more remarkable. So remember, the opening tragedy was followed by a great act of loyalty on the part of Ruth. And that is now matched by Boaz's act of loyalty that leads to the family's final restoration. And this 
symmetry, it highlights the design of the internal chapters as well. So each of the chapters begins with Naomi and Ruth making a plan for their future, and that's followed by a providential meeting between Ruth and Boaz, and each chapter concludes with Naomi and Ruth rejoicing at what's taken place. This story is beautifully designed, and that design actually connects with a really interesting feature of the story, and that's how little God is mentioned. Right, the characters talk about God a few times, but the narrator actually never once mentions God doing anything directly in the story, and that's its brilliance. Because God's providence is at work behind every scene of this story, weaving together the circumstances and choices of all these characters. So Naomi, her tragedy leads her to think that God is punishing her, but actually the whole story is about God's mission to restore her and her family. And he's doing so through Ruth, through her boldness and loyalty, which brings healing to Naomi's life, but not without Boaz, who's a no-nonsense farmer who's full of generosity and loyalty. And so God uses his integrity combined with Ruth's boldness to save Naomi and her family. And so this story brilliantly explores the interplay of God's purposes and will with human decision and will. God weaves together the faithful obedience of his people to bring about his redemptive purposes in the world. And that leads to the real end of the story. The book of Ruth concludes with a genealogy showing how Boaz and Ruth's son, Oved, was the grandfather of King David, from whom came the lineage of the Messiah. And so all of a sudden, these seemingly mundane, ordinary events in this story are woven into God's grand story of redemption for the whole world. And so the book of Ruth invites us to consider how God might be at work in the very ordinary, mundane details of our lives as well. And that's what the book of Ruth is all about. Mm. All right, so one of the overarching questions that the book of Ruth uh, asks is, how is God involved in the joys and the hardships of our lives, right? And so we want to carry that as we conclude and look at the fourth chapter of Ruth, that is going to be one of our or overarching questions that we too are going to look at. So again, as a summary of what we just listened to, Ruth was a widowed Moabite woman in the time of Judges, right? She was widowed, which means she was uh, without her husband, without male representation in biblical times. Uh, meant that uh, a woman was on a lower level of the social order. Right. She was widowed, which means that she was grieving. The Bible says that she was wearing grieving clothes. Right. She only took it off in chapter three. So uh, it also says that she was a Moabite woman, which means that she was an outsider. Right. The Moabites. If you remember two weeks ago, we learned that the Moabites were um, thought of as uh, abominations because of their religious practices to the Israelites. The Moabites were actually um uh worshipers of idols right so they she was a widow she was a moabite she was an outsider and of course we're in a woman in a man ran world right and it was in a time of judges when it was a coin flip on if those judges were going to be nice or cruel it was instable leadership now that's the context of what was going on in the midst of that the Israelite people are still practicing Levitical law, which centers around not only survival of a people, but also establishing a moral and ethical framework for what and who they want to be. We want to be a society that thinks about the poor and the widow. So when you read the book of Leviticus, there's a whole lot of uh, um, chapters dedicated to the poor and the widowed and how you should treat them, right? That's going to be important for what we have coming up. Also, the reason why uh, Ruth and Naomi were in Boaz's field is out a product of the Levitical law that says if you own land and someone is poor, if someone is widowed, you should allow them to work the land as voluntary slaves, you know, excuse the language, or involuntary indentured servants, 
um, so that they might be able to gain a wage. So they can either gain a wage by the surplus that they bring in that day, right? So they get to work so they can eat. All right. Boaz was unique in his kindness as a landowner. And we've already lifted up like how unique and special Boaz was. All right. So group group work. I want you all to reflect on these first three chapters. And I want you all to let me know how is God involved in the joys and the hardships of Ruth's life? How is God involved? I want to hear back from you. I'm going to break you up into groups. We don't got that much time. We got uh, about 15 minutes, 15 minutes, and we'll go into our groups and our breakout sessions, and then we will uh, come back together and we'll discuss um, everything else. So you need to uh, accept. It's only going to be three breakout rooms, so it's not that many. All right. Okay, I just opened all the rooms. So you should be able to accept whatever room you're going to. Remember, you got to click and accept being uh, invited into the room. How is God involved in the joys and hardships of Ruth's life?
All right, we should all be back now. Uh, I'd like to hear from the uh, three groups real quick. Group number one, what, what were some of you all's takeaways in conversation like? Delana, you want to give? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, we first talked about Ruth and Naomi and how Ruth was put in a position uh, that I that we felt like was ordained by God. Uh, and at the time that she probably said she was gonna stay with Naomi, they, neither one of them had an idea of what blessings they were gonna receive. Uh, Naomi was blessed with a son-in-law uh, and a grandson and a daughter. Then we talked about uh, how hardships that we've been through and how God has come through and pulled us out. And Reverend Stanley shared about Natasha's journey. And I shared about some friends that have lost loved ones and how they've lost themselves through the grieving process like Naomi did, where she was totally given up. And pretty much that's what all we talked about. That's good. Uh, group number two. Y'all want me to share what I wrote down, guys? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'm sure that is the case. Okay, uh, our group was very, very, uh, um, I won't say talkative, but we had a lot of opinions to put down. So uh, bear with me as I read my little chicken scratch on here to try to figure out what we said. Uh, one of the things we did say was um, they both had to show compassion toward each other and God had to show compassion to them, even though, God is not speaking, but compassion was was one great thing. Um, even though God wasn't speaking, he guided uh, them in the right way. You know, they could have gone any place else or done all, a lot of things, but uh, that was that was the walk of the uh, right way. Uh, and he allowed he, they allowed the Lord uh, to take care of them. Um. Let me see. Oh, when when uh, um, Ruth told Naomi that uh, your God is my God and and your family is my family, or some words like that, that uh, that showed uh, faith and and confidence in her that that she's going to do the best to take care of her whichever way, and God blessed her through all of those different things uh, that we we heard about in this book. Um, we have they they were obedient. If God was directing them, they could have not heard, but God, uh, uh, they heard and was obedient. Um, we have to be careful when we look overall thinking of, of Ruth and Naomi. Um, we have to make sure not to judge too soon. You know, sometimes we get black or white or whatever it is, and we judging before we even know that person. I think uh, um, it was a point made that that um, they were already on track with each other. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Vaughn was saying, Kim was saying that uh, character matters. You know, if, if you did not have the character of love or the character of commitment or, or uh, those kind of things, then that could have been a lot of things happened, but they showed their character toward each other. Um, uh, one person commented that God did not have to speak. Um, well, I just lost that. <laughs> it's all good. Just Greg. Oh, we we uh, it was about it was about character. If if God was over the whole thing and 
uh, that showed the character of, of uh, Ruth and Naomi to be faithful. And I think the last thing I have is, uh, by love, we will know uh, God's character. So so if if we do the things that we've been taught, God's character comes through and we see God's character and we uh, uh, try to be more obedient to whatever we think that God has shown us to do. That's my spiel. Thank you, Brother Crawford. That was good. <laughs> uh, all right, group number three. When I popped in group number three, y'all were having a robust conversation, so it might be hard to encapsulate everything that you all were talking about. Uh, but group number three. Miss Edwards. Mama Clifton, why don't you go ahead and speak for the group, please? <laughs> Okay, I didn't take notes, but one of the, the things, uh, some of the things we talked about were Ruth saw something in Naomi. Um, after Naomi lost her husband and both of her sons, she changed her name to Bitter. Mm. But in spite of that, Ruth saw something in her mother-in-law, and so she followed uh, Naomi, who became Mara. And uh, when she got to uh, her mother-in-law's country, Ruth became obedient. Um, she told her mother-in-law where she went, she would go, and her God, her mother-in-law's God, would be her God. She worked in a field where she was protected because there were other places where she could have worked that would have been dangerous, but she worked in the field of uh, Naomi's kinsmen. She mm -hmm. worked hard. She worked sun up to sun down and provided so that there would be food for both of them. We're talking about a situation where the going to the field daily was necessary. We're talking about to, to make ends meet. There came a point when Naomi said to Ruth, this is what I need you to do. And she told um Ruth to sleep at the feet of Boaz, there, there came a point when um, Boaz noticed Ruth, uh, respected Ruth. Eventually, the, the two of them married, and from that marriage uh, began a birth that eventually led to David that eventually led to Christ um, so that there was the lineage of Christ that started out from a woman named Ruth who left her country and obeyed her mother-in-law in a different country. That's good. Thank you, Ms. Teresa. So I, I knew I knew you all going to do this and uh, y'all fall into my traps. Uh, teaching traps every day. And it's all good to fall into teaching traps. Uh, so how God is involved in the joys. So we all, each group talked about the ultimate joy. Very rarely do we, even, even for the groups that did mention how God turned some things around, very few times do we take time to sit with the hardships of life. We can talk about the joys 
That's why we show up on Sunday. It's, it's, it is literally for us to reflect upon the blessings and the good things that God has done for us. But very rarely do we sit with the hardships, right? And when you read chapter four, there are a couple of things that there, there actually there's a number of things, but we only got time for a couple. A number of things that come to mind when I think about chapter four. The first thing is when we talk about hardships is the rejection, right? We jump to Boaz and how good Boaz was to Ruth by choosing Ruth. But we, we skip over the fact that she was rejected first. In, in, in verse five, it says, then Boaz said, the day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you will be acquiring Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead man, to maintain the dead man's name and his inheritance. At this, the next of kin said, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself for I cannot redeem it. How does God work through rejection? Particularly rejection from somebody who is supposed to be your redemption, your way to redemption. Remember, Ruth was a widowed Moabite woman, she had no rights. Naomi's son and the land that he had was the only thing she might have access to. But she could not, as a Moabite, an outsider, as a woman, go and get the land that was rightfully hers. She needed somebody to be her benefactor. And the next of kin, the book of Leviticus says that the closest next of kin is supposed to be the representative of a woman or a child should the parent or husband pass away. What do you do when the people that are supposed to take care of you reject you? Ooh. Mm. Mm. Right? When you read chapter four, before Boaz shows up, Ruth is being rejected. Now, I think in order for us to understand a little bit of how God is involved in the rejection, we have to understand what verse six says, when the next of kin denies Boaz's, um, um, what is it? Uh, the word is skipping me. He denies Boaz's, uh, um, the guardian uh, redeemer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Offer. There it offer. is. He denies mm -hmm. Boaz's offer. Offer. Mm -hmm. Right? He yeah. says, I cannot do that. Take my right of redemption yourself, mm -hmm. or I cannot redeem it. So, in order for us to understand where God is in all of this, you have to understand what right of redemption is. Now, for all of my uh, People who are really into real estate, you understand what right of redemption is in today's terms. Right of redemption is a term that is used in the mortgage uh, housing industry, right? Mm -hmm. It is a legal process. So say you are delinquent in your mortgage before they begin the foreclosure process. If you so happen to come up with the money. You can have a redemption. You can have redemption. Yes. In some states, the foreclosure process could already have taken place. Mm -hmm. But if you come up with the money, you get a mm -hmm. chance to get back what you had lost. That's true. But you must pay a penalty. You must pay interest. And in those states where they allow you to go into the foreclosure process, you have to pay the foreclosure costs. 
So your redemption comes at a price that you have to pay. Right. But in the Levitical terms, right of redemption is found in Leviticus chapter 25. Right of re re redemption is connected to the year of Jubilee. Right. Year of Jubilee was essentially a socioeconomic reset. When the Israelites left uh, Egypt and they were establishing a new world, a new society that they were living, they baked in the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee meant every 50 years you were supposed mm -hmm. to leave wherever you were, whatever you might have accumulated, whatever you might have uh, tied to your name as far as resources and money, and you were to return to the original plot of land that you were given every 50 years. And while this sounds crazy in our minds today, for you to leave where you live right now and to go back to where you come from or as far back as you can know, right? It's me leaving my house in North Tulsa to go to Gene Autry, Oklahoma, hmm. to the plot of land <laughs> at Gene Autry, Oklahoma, every 50 years. So, that, so it was once a generation you had to do this. It's crazy to think right now, but it was based off of this theological understanding that the land is not yours, the land is God's. Hmm. That's number one. Number two, it made sure, because remember, Le the, the Leviticus, book of Leviticus was, was centered on the poor and the widowed, that if you were poor, you would not stay generationally poor. Should life happen to you, and the consequences of death, poor decisions, uh, loss of money, all of those things, whatever it might have been, it is not something that would affect the next generation. The year of Jubilee was a reset. So if I was poor and I had nothing, everything that I owed up until that point was forgiven. And I was able to go back to my land and have the land that I might have had to give away. So the right of redemption is giving the poor back what they had already lost. It's making right what was wrong and it's freeing the enslaved, but without paying a penalty. Right? Now, if you can imagine, if you were poor and you were widowed, your entire life was consumed with getting to the year of Jubilee. But Ruth was rejected. You've been waiting all this time for your redemption and she was rejected. Hmm. Hmm. Was she rejected because she wasn't an Israelite? I, now that's now. The, the, so the text insinuates that. In verse mm -hmm. five, in mm -hmm. verse five, whenever the next of kin thinks that he's going to get Naomi's portion of the inheritance, he's okay with it. Remember, he's not getting anything that Ruth owns. This is Naomi's next of kin. So oh. what they're about to get is Naomi's husband's mm -hmm. stuff that was sent to given to her boys, who both her boys and her husband died. Oh, so this next of kin has an opportunity to maybe quadruple or double what he already has. But whenever you throw in the caveat, you have to marry up this Moabite woman named Ruth. The next of kin says, no, nah, I'm good. So Leviticus 25, 25, if one of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold? Correct. Oh. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. 
and yeah. Ruth and Naomi were rejected initially. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What we might see God doing in this text is challenging us to think about how we show up for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. How do we participate in the opportunity of redemption for somebody else? And then how do we not participate? Are there people who are hoping that we Give them rege redemption, but we reject them. Mm. <sighs> All right. I got to push. We're running out of time now. The other okay. thing, too, is this. Never once in the book of Ruth does it say that Boaz loves Ruth. <laughs> no no it doesn't say that Boaz loves Ruth what it says is is that he's aware of her character mm -hmm. does not say that he loves Ruth if you read verse 9 it yeah. says then Boaz said to the elders and all the people today you are a witness that I have acquired the land the hand of Naomi and all that belong to Amalek and all that belongs to Chilion and uh, Malion. Mm -hmm. I have also acquired Ruth, the Moabite. Yeah. To maintain, look at the reason why, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. In order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred and from the gates of his native place. Today you are a witness. The hardship that Ruth has to deal with, what she has to wrestle with is this. Does this man love me or is he legally obligated to be with me? Mm, mm, mm. what do you do when you find yourself in situations relationships or situationships where you have to wrestle with do they love me or are they legally obligated to be with me it's cheaper to keep her <laughs> does he really love me does she really love me you're supposed to do this because the law says so do you really love me are you only doing this out of some type of societal obligation how do we know how does Ruth know how do we navigate these relationships it's a struggle it's survival it How do we survive. know that Ruth was even looking for love? Look, sounds like she was acting unselfishly, so perhaps she wasn't even considering her and somebody to love her. Correct. Maybe she didn't care. Mm -hmm. If yeah. he loved her, she just wanted to do right by uh, Naomi. Do, do, does the by, outside of Naomi giving Ruth some lessons in chapter three, do we know if Ruth like Tara said, even wanted to be with Boaz. Naomi oh, illustrated this. It's Naomi's land and inheritance, and Ruth is just thrown into it. There was no love there when Boaz said he acquired. He acquired, he acquired Ruth. It never yes, says it never says that he loved her. No. No. So what? But he only said that to maintain what? The name of the dead for uh the property. He said that he, yeah, he to maintain Naomi's property. Remember, property. Ruth has no property. Right. Everything that Ruth possibly could have is connected to Naomi. Right. Mm -hmm. 
but I think uh, Ruth was just trying to survive in a world that she didn't really know anything about. She was doing the things that she had been instructed to do and she was obedient to those and you know the blessings came because of that. Yeah, she was being given a gift. I oh. think. No, was no, it no, survival or was it wrong. servitude? Like was it survival or servitude? Perhaps she was submitted fully. Yeah. She said, okay, mm -hmm. whatever comes with it, I'll take it. Right. Mm -hmm. Was it survival or authentic servitude? Let me push with that transitional question. How do we use this form of relationship with God? Are we in survival mode? And that's why I show up to God out of fear of not making it to heaven. Out of a legal obligation to try to live as righteous as possible. Or do I authentically love God? Do you show up out of obligation? Or do you show up at an authentic love and adoration? Mm. Mm. As Sunday, as this Wednesday night Bible study becomes so routine that these are the only moments where you try to encounter God. If so, I might argue that you have a routine, legalized relationship with God. That. that if I loved God, I would be constantly trying to seek out an ongoing communicative relationship with God. Yeah. I would pray without ceasing. Yes. <laughs> I'd read my Bible every day. Yeah, not I'd a routine. Meditate with them. Yes. Seek him every day. Hmm. You know. Yes. This this question came to me too. Say Boaz is only performing a legal and moral obligation. Does the how in God showing up? Does that matter? Because at the end of the day, it turned out to be an answered prayer. Mm -hmm. Or at least an answered desire. Does it matter to you how God shows up? If God said, I'm going to use somebody who does not love you, but only feels a legal obligation to take care of you, would that be sufficient enough for you to still give God praise? It ain't how I wanted it. Oh. Right? How is God involved in the joys and the hardships of our life? In conclusion, I think this. that God is a God, particularly in this narrative and what they're trying to do in the Old Testament is to fortify on already told stories, to regurgitate them so that it is a, a, a rhythm, it is a pattern, so that it is embedded into the people's hearts and in their minds. In the book of Genesis, we read about a God who created something out of nothing, who gave order in the midst of chaos. But we see it happening again in the book of Ruth. At the beginning of the book of Ruth, her husband is dead. She becomes a traveling woman. She is a field worker. She is rejected. She is then accepted by Boaz. She then inherits, inherits the land that had been lost to her and now has access to double. She has a male child who has a Christological connection. Only God can take a dead it situation is. and connect it with a Christological connection. God does that when we are in the midst of our chaotic mm -hmm. situations, not just the joys, but the hardships of our lives. Can we 
be confident enough that God, it's not how I want it to be done, but allow your will to be done, however your will should be done, and allow me in the midst of it not to have a legalistic approach to you, but to be authentically in love with you. So whenever there is an opportunity for redemption for the year of Jubilee, that I'm open enough to receive it, not just for myself, but even give it to other people and to know, God, you are working this thing out for my mm. good. In the midst of the chaos, God is working it out. That's how God is involved. God is involved in the chaos. God, we thank you for today. For those that came into this Bible study out of routine, God, we thank you. Because it's not how that we are worried about. It's that they showed up. And if they came in here out of routine and they just so happen to be in the midst of chaos, God, we thank you for your ability to bring order out of the chaotic situations in our lives. Yes. Help us, God, to grow better and to grow closer to you so that we might be able to not have a legalistic approach to you, but have an authentic love for you. And God, should you bless us before mm -hmm. the year of Jubilee, allow us to be an accepting, redemptive factor to somebody else. Help us, God, to be open to the receipt of redemption. Mm. As we wait in anticipation for the year of Jubilee, awesome. we thank you. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Questions? Amen. Comments, concerns, or announcements. Amen. Amen. Mm. All right. Uh, we got the community listening session that's coming up. Is that that's Thursday? Uh, it's Saturday at ten a.m. No, it's Saturday. Okay, Saturday. Okay, Saturday at ten o'clock, and then we're having our a meet and greet with our new members on Sunday. So Sunday, we are, we've been blessed actually at Antioch. Like we have 22 uh, new members who have joined the church. And so we give God praise for that. That is something to be celebrated. But we want to make them feel at home. We know that uh, the sense and the feeling of authentic love and connection is what keeps people in the church. And so yes. this Sunday, we want to meet and greet them. We want to welcome them, let them know how they can get connected to the church through our various ministries, how they can give back to the community, if that's what they want to give back to, how they can be in relationship with us. So I'm asking all the ministry leaders, uh, actually the uh, the ministry teams that are the uh, recruitment person, as with each ministry team can show up, we give them the names of the ministry contact person as well so if you want to show up for the name of the faith that'd be dope as well but we need ministers ministry leaders um to show up so that we can uh greet our our, our new members on on sunday okay and that'll be from nine until ten on sunday other than that if there's nothing else may the grace of god and the sweet communion of his holy spirit rest on the by with each and every one of us henceforth now and forevermore until we see each other again, may God be the order in the midst of your chaos. Amen. Amen. Bless. Amen. Amen.